Okay, and so welcome to another edition of Favorite Funny. I'm your host, Carl Kozlowski, and each time I bring you another uh, famous person who has uh, going to be sharing their funniest life stories from their career and beyond in their life, as well as what their favorite funny books and movies and TV shows and comedians are. And uh, this time I'm excited to be bringing you uh, actor John Capellas, who uh, is perhaps best known, although he probably hates being this being brought up, best known as Carl the Janitor in The Breakfast Club, but um, he's done over 200 other roles, a very illustrious career, and has worked with many, many greats, and we'll be talking about all that today uh, here on Favorite Funny. So thanks for joining me, John. You are very welcome, Carl. Very welcome. It's good to be here. Yeah, so you're out in L.A. Uh, right now, correct? I certainly am. I'm out in L.A. Yeah, out. so then uh, how, how has the acting scene uh, been working out for you amid the pandemic? Have you managed to stay busy as much as can be? And are things picking up out there now? I think that things are picking up slowly. I think that the pandemic uh, naturally slowed things down. I um, was fortunate to get a little bit of work and had been, uh, I did an episode of the show Big Sky and uh, also uh, a couple of uh, Hallmark movies and um, have kept myself relatively busy. I write and, uh, you know, explore various other activities. But I think that um, Hollywood generally, I think, is picking up. I think that uh, folks are getting back to work. That's good. You know, I yeah, think also, overall, I mean, I hope that um, everything's going to pick up. That's another story, right? Yeah. So, uh, well, let's get into it uh, and share some uh, uh, great stories of your life. Uh, I mean, you grew up Greek in Canada, and you mentioned that that's a pretty unusual scenario to be in. Like, what, what, what made it unique, and what are some uh, perhaps favorite funny moments from, from that kind of uh, upbringing? Well, I don't know how unique it is in so far as, you know, um, growing up to be uh, an ethnic Canadian, I think at that time was in my area of the world, London, Ontario was, was rare, but not so rare. My dad had come over and faced the first wave of Canadian uh, uh, reactions to foreigners when he was 11, 12 years old. So he took the brunt of it. I was born in Canada and um, you know, um, it, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, my mom was American and my father was from Greece and all my relatives had were, you know, born in between Greece and Canada and sometimes in the States and <laughs> I made fun of everybody, Carl, and uh, was y the youngest of a lot of people. So um, I sort of looked up a lot to people and uh, had a unique vantage point, you know, and uh, that often got me in trouble as I grew up, and there were, there are still a lot of relatives to this day who sort of hold a grudge for my, I don't know whether I had rapier wit, but I certainly was a bit of an annoyance. And I sort of parlayed my annoyance into other things. I got involved in theater and, and did things like that. But I was a typical sort of youngest child in that I, uh, as they, I, I bucked authority, as they say. Huh. So I mean, were you like a class clown? uh or that kind of thing or what well yeah i mean if i was to fit into a vent i guess i was somewhat of a class clown but i think it was more a uh a, a class shit disturber mis mis mischief maker um i would clown sometimes but i think that the clowns got often were a little bit more foolish i think it was a, i was a bit more i was a bit slyer or thought i was until i got yeah. caught i got caught at most everything i did so you know yeah. making fun of people i got caught you know whatever it was never yeah. never any fun getting caught well what, uh, what, how did your folks react to that were they pretty strict or did they think it's funny um good question i think they were probably pretty strict i think i think at the end of the proverbial day they thought some things were funny they did have senses of humor but i you know i also think that the um, I think that they found my behavior sometimes a little bit more troublesome than funny. Huh, gotcha. So, I mean, is there like I, a worst, is there a worst got, incident? Well, I mean, I, I got caught getting drunk when I was in eighth grade and 
in other words, I got caught. I mean, I came home drunk and <laughs> got sick all over in the inside of my parents' car when my friend stuffed me. It was it's a pretty <laughs> dismal experience. And and like I really got me in big trouble and everybody at school heard about it. And I was I was really raked over the coals. And there were a couple of other incidents. Um, I got caught shoplifting. <laughs> Wow. You know, but I, I was in seventh grade, eighth grade, so I got I got caught shoplifting two Playboys. Um, anyway, well, if you're gonna shoplift, that's the thing to do. Yeah, well, the thing is, it wasn't like I was boosting a car or, or you know breaking yeah. into a jewelry store or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was beyond my. Uh, I, I was a pretty and and um, my days as a criminal were short lived. My moments as a criminal, but. Dan Aykroyd often said that uh, the criminal mind is very close to the comic mind and uh, it's just sort of figuring a way to the joke is kind of like figuring a way to the gold sometimes. Okay, so um, where you really started to take off in your life was the direction you're going in is you went through Second City in Chicago uh, or, or in Toronto. Yeah, like which a one duck were you through one, like whatever, it's through a duck. I beg your pardon? You what? Which second city were you in? Uh, I um, I started in Toronto, um, okay. walking second city in Toronto um, at the time. And um, and then I uh, got involved in second city television as an extra. And from there, I got an audition with second city in Chicago. So ultimately, I was in the touring company of second city in Chicago and then got in the resident company of second city in Chicago. Okay, so yeah. then, uh, I mean, uh, was that your first attempt at acting altogether, or did you uh, work your way up to it, like in high school or college, like doing drama, that kind of thing? I did. I did drama in high school and in college, uh, and um, um, I, I decided to be an actor after my third year in university, and um, took a year off. <laughs> in other words, dropped out, and. Um, uh, made a pact with my dad after I sort of took some time off. I worked in an oil rig, worked in a record store, um, sort of was an itinerant, you know, fuck off year, so to speak. Um, <laughs> I think they're now officially in the, in the it's in the dictionary. Um, and, you know, and then my dad made a, a deal with me. I thought very wisely. He said, listen, if you want to be an actor, I told him I want to be an actor. And he said, well, listen, give it a year. If you get a job, you know, hang on to it. If not, if, if nothing happens in a year, which at the time I thought was a nice long period of time, <laughs> looking back on it, I realized how short it was. But, um, you know, so I looked around and I uh, was in Toronto and I got involved with Second City kind of quickly. Uh, I watched uh, the, the, uh, some shows. I mean, I got, you know, the improvs were free. I hung around. Uh, I started taking workshops and I just took to it like oh, it was the best thing. And it, it combined a lot of my skill set. You know, I was, it was quick. It was funny. I didn't have to learn other people's stuff. Um, and and uh, there, was, there was a need for it. There was kind of a, you know, comedy uh, in terms of improvisational comedy at that time was coming into a very sort of golden period. So... Um, <laughs> Why not? And um, the what, what period was this? What what years in the sixties or seventies or what? Um, it would be um, late seventies. From seventy, okay. uh, I got I got into Second City Chicago on August fourth, fifth, uh, nineteen seventy eight, and I toured from nineteen seventy eight through nineteen eighty two. Uh, with the day that Charles and Di got married, I think it was in June eighty two. And then I was in the main company for four years until about 86, 87, and then 86. And then I, uh, we did a show in New York with Second City. I was there. And then I also, then I left and started, I did Roxanne, I think in 86. And it's the first movie I did beyond Second City. I'd done a bunch when I was in Second City. Oh, that's cool. So um, any favorite memory from Second City? That was funny. Uh, <laughs> I went through Second City, uh, the conservatory, in 94 to 96 and i worked as a writer for bizco for a year doing writing you know their corporate comedy stuff but i got canned uh <laughs> after the year uh because um i wrote a, a satirical article it was the truth but it was 
I, I, I tried to be a smart ass in it for a weekly called New City in Chicago. Um, I wrote a cover story about how uh, the Bizco um, sent me out for four days as an inflatable dinosaur to promote Kraft macaroni and cheese. And I wrote about the horrific experiences I had getting punched and spat on and, you know, all sorts of horrible behavior by the public towards me in this dinosaur suit. And uh, Kraft Mac and Cheese didn't like it. And they let Second City know that they were very displeased. And so Second City was like, take a hike. And uh, that's how I want to be a journalist instead of working at Second City like you did for a long time. But I mean, do you have like a favorite uh, um, improv moment or was there somebody that you got to work with on stage, like even as a <laughs> guest appearance that you were like, wow, I can't believe so-and-so just did a guest spot with me? Well, first of all, that's a pretty, that's a pretty sad story. You stepped on some <coughs> corporate toes. Is Kraft um, p and I mean, uh, Kraft. Oh, yeah, I think so. They're were, they were up there. They're one of those. Yeah. Of course, Kraft is Kraft. They're not p and is p and <coughs> Pardon me. Um, what I think, um, just what your story reminded me of, there was an actor who's long dead, Second City alum. His name was Tom Earhart. Okay. Um, you may know him if you're okay. sort of a, um, <laughs> no trivia about uh, Second City actors and also the 60s. Tom was the guy in, in the 60s who had an, he had an incredibly beautiful and fulsome voice and his voice was Schlitz, go for the gusto. And if you go on YouTube now and take a look at those commercials from anywhere from 65, 67 to 71 or two. But Tom was also um, a fall down drunk. And um, he was in a Michigan Avenue bar that was frequented by all the advertising uh, bigwigs, J. Walter Thompson and the like. And I think J. Walter handled the Schlitz account and he was drinking his heart's content at about three, four in the afternoon. And little did he know that all the guys from Schlitz and the Jay Walter account were at a table down in the bar just having finished the lunch themselves. And the bartender yelled at a drunk Tom Earhart and he said, hey, Tom, how about a Schlitz? He goes, I wouldn't drink that piss if you paid me. And they of course did pay me. All the executives heard it and within an hour, he was exed out of a a pretty, pretty substantial job at that time. I'm sure it was, wow. it was huge money. That said, you stepped on some corporate toes. I'm sorry to hear that. That's a sad story, Carl. But uh, <laughs> well, what? it was, it was, it was kind of funny because the guy that that uh, uh, nixed me, I won't say his name because I don't I, like I don't want to restir bad blood or whatever. But because Second City has been very nice to me over the years anyway, because when I wound up as press. Um, I did a lot of stories about them. So like Kelly Leonard, who runs Second City to this day, um, like whenever I go to Chicago and I want to get good seats, it hooks me up and whatever. He so, doesn't run it to this day, Carl. He doesn't? No, Second City has overgone. Uh, it, do a Google. Oh, in the past year, there was like a big shakeup. I didn't, Kelly's out? I think Kelly's gone. And I think, wow. uh, I think um, Second City has totally new ownership and there's a new artistic person. They're it's all sad. Gone. It's all changed. Yeah, I, I mean, reading about that was, I mean, is that something you want to comment on or avoid? Because I have a question I could come up with about that, unless it's too touchy. What do you think? Ask me. I mean, I'm not Okay, gonna, yeah, if you want to avoid it, just thing. avoid it. But no, because well, I mean, it's, it struck me as it was a strange um, situation because, you know, there was all this tumult um, caused by some of it very justified that I think anybody could endorse um uh that you know th there's there is inequities in showbiz and there is inequities in society racially but um it was bizarre to me that second city which has always been a bastion of progressivism and which you know i mean when i was there in the 90s it was all white but the thing was uh, as i visited over the years they had become very diverse in their cast so it was shocking to me when Andrew Alexander, the owner, was like made himself quit and sold off his his uh, interest in Second City, um, just because some random person accused them of being uh, unfair or un you know insensitive racially, and it just was bizarre to me that 
you know, somebody that big could would take himself out. And and it doesn't it didn't seem to me like anything good as far as legitimate objective good comedy would come out of you know completely capitulating just for the sake of it, it just seemed like a, like a really bad example of taking it too far and wokeness to the extreme rather than hey we're trying to do we're trying to make things a little better for everybody in comedy uh, did, if you care to comment either way I don't want to get you in trouble. Um, you know, I'd love to know what you think. I'm not going to get in trouble. Okay. There's, there's nothing to, to get in trouble about. Um, I worked for Bernie Sollins and Joyce Sloan. Yeah. Um, they were my bosses from 78 through 86, 87 when I left. Um, it was an independent theater. They made the choices as to who got on their stage. Um, we were a very liberal, uh, progressive, inclusive group of people. I never encountered any racism. I probably encountered more sexism and misogyny, frankly, at, sex, at Second City. And you can probably ask a lot of the women that were there at that time before or perhaps after. And I think that there were lots of things that were, you know, improper, as there are in a lot of theatrical situations. People behave badly, ambition corrupts, and early ambition and desperation uh, combined with modicum of talent and desire, you know. Now, I'm not dressing it up because I think there are a lot of people who behave really shitty in certain ways, but I'm of the mind that if you go back and take that apart, <laughs> the new ownership of Second City sent out an email asking people to, now it's time to be safe and now, now, now it's safe to come forward with your stories. The most successful people have negative stories. Everybody has, I think it's a very, very provocative and dangerous thing to do to unearth things that um, could be apocryphal. A lot of people are dead, can't answer. And I also believe that institutions change. Yeah. So if Second City, granted, did not have a lot of, you know, people of color, that's for sure. Uh, but there weren't even, women weren't fairly represented on stage. There were two women and five guys in the company sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's, that's not saying, oh, look how far we've come. It's just saying, you know, um, whatever institutions were, and, you know, they call them, uh, they, the, the term now is system, systemic racism. I don't think that, that, that uh, I don't think you can just talk about this in, in a, the theater in America, in, in a, in a, bubble. I think you have to talk about systemic racism and show business. And like, and if you really want to get down to it, I faced issues because I'm not a blue eyed blonde guy with a full head of hair. I'm not going to play leading men. No, I think that's bullshit. Um, but brown eyed guys, uh, you know, well, you're Mediterranean, you know, play a lot of bad guys, play a lot of seamy characters, you know, now, not all, like John Stamos, you know, he's a Greek guy, but, you know, I, I would say that, that a lot of ethnic types in show business, non-people of color, you know, people that might be European extraction, but not necessarily Northern European, run into the same sort of um, issues in show business, not exactly the same and maybe not as virulent, but we are working at becoming a better place. I think Second City has room to move, but the people that have taken it over now have just fired the staff. A lot of people that have been there from 35, 40 years. They've treated a lot of people badly. They're beginning with a pretty dismal feeling amongst a lot of the alumni. And I'm at the far end of this universe, Carl. Yeah. And I'm, I'm feeling the blowback and I'm getting word on 
various social media sources of how people feel. And frankly, they got to put bums in the seats, they've got to sell drinks, and they got to make people laugh. If they can do that and keep a theater going and but you don't do it, do it with uh, diversity ratios and, and people wagging their fingers and saying, this is the way it should be. It never has worked that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, thank you for a great answer. So um, you, you gave me an interesting list of people that you've met. Uh, you've met Tennessee Williams, Whitney Allen. I don't know who Jerry Paris is, but you also said Fred Willard, Robert Klein, Walter Cronkite, Bill Clinton, and Jimmy Carter. So the one that jumps to mind for me is, uh, what is what was it like meeting Bill Clinton? It's only for a moment, actually. I'm just, oh. I put those names down because- Gotcha. Uh, I, but I, I said, I voted for you three times. And <laughs> he laughed. I said, you know what they say in Chicago, vote early, vote often. <laughs> and yeah. he laughed, we talked for a few seconds and then we had our pictures taken. I had a picture taken with him and Steven Spielberg. Oh, really? Wow. So I can show yeah, you that. So, so which of these would you have like a, more of a story about? Um, again, Tennessee Williams, Woody Allen. Tennessee Fred Williams Willard. came and saw a Second City show and he, uh, we were had, celebrating some event, a theatrical event in Chicago and he was really, really drunk. Oh no. And, and really? I tried to have a conversation with him but he was just interested in meeting boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not interested in, in hanging out with him with regard to that. So that, that was the end of my conversation with Tennessee Williams. You know, um, Jerry Paris was the neighbor in Dick Van Dyke and he was also, oh, okay. uh, you know, Jerry Helper, but he was also an amazing actor in his own right. Um, keep on going down the list. Alan Arkin, Cloris Leachman, is she on that list? No, you uh, didn't have her on this list, but uh, Woody Allen, uh, any, anything unique about that meeting? I went to dinner with Woody Allen and um, wow. he and Mia Farrow. And- uh, Oh, that must've been happy. Uh, well, it was, it was early on. Oh, okay. I, I don't know exactly when it fits into this whole uh, Michigas, this whole HBO time, you know, Allen versus Farrow thing. Um, I, I think they had just finished Crimes and Misdemeanors. Is she in that film? Uh, I don't think she's in it. Uh, not that I recall. I remember Angelica Houston was the main woman in it. No, and I was about to do Broadway Danny Rose or something. Well, yeah, the, she was in that. Yeah. The dinner was with Carlo Di Palma, the cinematographer, uh -huh. uh, Italian cinematographer, and uh, his wife, and uh, a couple of other friends of ours. And Woody and Mia shared one plate, and they sort of sat towards one another. And they sort of were eating off of one plate, sort of looking and billing and cooing off of one another and were somewhat communicative to the rest of the table, although you felt like you were kind of piercing their cocoon. Um, uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> I can't say he said anything memorable. I probably fucking talked more than anybody. <laughs> well, I got a funny Woody uh, moment um, when he did... Uh, movie called to, to, From Rome with Love or To Rome with Love. It was right after Midnight in Paris. He did one in Rome. And uh, I go to the press day at the Beverly Wilshire, uh, not, the, not the Hilton one, but there's another one on the uh, Four Seasons, I guess, on Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills. And uh, I ran into the wrong part of the, the hotel. Uh, there's two distinct buildings divided by a little driveway. And uh, anyway, so I ran in the wrong part. They're like, you're in the wrong building, sir. And I'm like, oh my God. And so I run to, out into the other building. I'm hauling ass up the stairs, you know, cause I'm like, Woody Allen, you know, this is before the new allegations about Dylan. And, you know, I still am a fan. I, I don't think one's work is a, uh, should be judged on the basis of one's personal life and who knows what to believe with the allegations anyway. But I'm running up the stairs and uh, there's this little old man, like kind of just slowly making it step by step. And I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my God. And, and I was like, excuse me. And I run, uh, as I run around the guy, I look back over my shoulder to apologize for, you know, being really fast and pushy. And I, and I look in Woody in the face 
So I almost like clobbered into Woody and probably would have ended his life right there on the stairs uh, because I was a good 320 and he was probably about 32 pounds. And, um, and he just gives me this crazy look like, oh my God. And, <laughs> and then he does this press conference. But at the end, I got to give him credit. He not only was cool about it, he signed the press notes for me. I still have the autograph. But, uh, you know, he's, anyway, that's my encounter with him, whether it's uh, whatever people might think of him. But what about um, any of these others have a, have a good story? Robert Klein, Fred Willard, Walter Cronkite, Jimmy Carter? Uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, met him briefly in Washington. His kids came and saw the show. Um, Chip uh, uh, and uh, <laughs> we did this blackout. We were at the cellar door in Washington, D.C. And I was in the touring company of Second City. And um, we do this blackout, which is like a short, almost like joke. You know what I mean? It's an up and down thing. And the blackout was guy runs across the stage with a bandana on, sort of running away. A cop runs out, Chicago cop with the checkerboard you know, the hat and the checkerboard band. Bang, 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 uses, fires his starter pistol we used on stage, so it was loud. Bang, 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 guy drops dead. Cop looks around and yells, freeze, lights out. Huh. Right? So that was the blackout. Guy goes out, shoots the guy, yells freeze after, right? So we're just loading up the starter pistol backstage at the village gate, I mean, at the uh, cellar door in uh, DC, which was this tiny little club in Georgetown, literally a postage stamp club, which sort of, you know, an audience that was maybe four rows deep and around sort of couple parts of the stage. So it was like, it must have been, I mean, 60, 70 people in the audience, small audience, but great club, rocking club. And we were loading the starter pistol up when these two guys literally like out of a cartoon with you know glasses on and stuff who were secret service came backstage and what the fuck is that what, what, what is that what, what, what are we doing what do you mean what are you doing and they sort of take the gun and then they push us backstage up against the wall i mean the bar was right there and stuff and goes what is this so who are you we're the secret service you've got chip carter and his brother ernie or whatever the hell his name was out in the audience and uh, you know, uh, and we're, ch we're checking for weapons. You know, well, we're actors in the show and this is what we begin the show with. They go, no, you don't. Huh. So we were moments away from beginning the show and starting the bang, 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 freeze. And then boom, boom, the cops would have opened or the secret service would have obliterated us and we would have died on stage. So God <laughs> knows what would have happened had they not seen one of our actors with a cop uniform on playing with a starter pistol, loading it with, you know, blanks um, at the stage door. So, I mean, that was, <laughs> and then inadvertently we got invited to the White House. Some guys actually got to stay at the White, I mean, got to go see a movie with Jimmy Carter. I met him briefly at the door um, when we were, um, at, at, when we went to, did another event uh, and he was there but it was so brief, I mean, it was crazy. And um, so it was less than my meeting with Bill Clinton. Ask me about somebody else. Okay, um, let's see. Well, uh, I mean, I, could, I, I can move on to some of these other things, but I guess- Cloris Leachman, um, Leachman grabbed my, my um, testicles. Oh, really, what was that? <laughs> because she just died recently and she was known as a literal a ball buster, a very funny, funny woman cursed like a uh, trooper. And uh, she liked to grab men by the uh, balls every now and then. So after a Second City show, she did one of these things, came up to me, you know, and I thought she was doing an underhanded pitch and went boom and grabbed me right in the groin and squeezed hard and said, hi, I'm Cloris. And I went, oh, I'm John. She laughed heartily and I was in shock. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's crazy, man. That's a, that's, well, a memory. that's a memory. So um, I guess, you know, don't shoot me for bringing this up, but like I mentioned, you know, like I'm, I'm very good friends with Steven Tobolowsky also. And it's a running joke with us about how, 
obsessed I am with making him say Ned Ryerson being uh, from Groundhog Day, even though he's done like you over 200 other roles. So, but oh, as far he's as great in also, he's great in Bossa Nova. What's that? You don't know that What's movie? That? No, oh. no. You, when you speak to him, tell him that John Kapalos loves him in Bossa Nova. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so if, he, if, the, the, if you're a friend of his and you don't know that movie, shame on you. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> 200 other roles, man. Um, no okay, so what, what, uh, what, what was it like working with John Hughes? You worked with him on 16 Candles and Breakfast Club, and you were like, you were the groom, right? In 16 Candles? That's what they tell me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, no. any thoughts about that? Yeah, well, you know, it's so long ago now, Carl, and a lot, people have asked me a lot of times, and I'm not, I'm not adverse to talking about it. But you know, the thing is, the thing that sort of is interesting as time goes by is what remains, and what remains are the fact that his movies still really speak to kids, and there's something about the teenage angst that he touched on. And the one thing about John that I give him credit for till today, despite um, some of the politically incorrect things like Long Duck Dong, which I never liked, yeah. and, stuff, and stuff like that, you know, there's a lot of slut shaming and stuff that's going on in some of his movies that is kind of tedious. But then, then teenage behavior is tedious, man. And um, I think that there's a lot of truth in that. You can't cut him out. But the one thing that is wonderful about John is that he um, he wrote to teens and he, he had a real uh, connection with Anthony Michael Hall. And when I watch Anthony Michael Hall and Sixteen Candles and even Weird Science, which is not one of my favorite movies, but um, of John Hughes movies, um, my favorite John Hughes movies are actually the ones that I'm not in. I mean, I really love Uncle Buck and I think Planes, Trains and Automobiles is fantastic. But Oh yeah. But um, John was intense. He was like a lot of directors controlling. I mean, you could say the same thing about David Fincher or any number of uh, directors today. I mean, they are very uh, in touch with who they cast, how they cast, um, in, in the situations, how they control their movies. And, um, you know, he was, uh, he was incredibly passive aggressive. I mean, sometimes you just didn't know what was going on. Um, not unlike situations you've had, you know, with his family in terms of dealing with them, they say yes on one hand, no on the other. And sometimes, you know, that can be troublesome. Uh, I don't know, unfortunately, you know, his wife, Nancy passed away. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, she passed away about a year and a half, two years ago now, I think. Mm. But um, so his children are left and uh, I hope that they enjoy the fact that their father was, you know, um, successful. I think the one thing that held John back was that sometimes he didn't play well with others. And uh, in Hollywood, they force you to play with others in ways that maybe, you know, are not as advantageous to your creative whatever. So he did some movies, I think Dennis and Menace or whatever that he produced that were not, I think, a Hughes standard. Yeah. I think at some point he left Hollywood because uh, he realized that, um, you know, power is fleeting and that he didn't have the same thing as he had maybe moments ago. But John is a very, very uh, enigmatic figure in a lot of ways. I mean, I got to say, I, I don't think I totally understand him, understood him and, or understand him even in retrospect. So um, the more people may ask me about him, the more I sort of sometimes think about it. And, um, you know, I feel sad, of course, that he's not around because I think that... Um, I think that he would probably uh, have enjoyed a resurgence and, and probably kept on making movies in a meaningful way. So. Yeah, yeah. So when you told me to ask you about Emilio Estevez and Apocalypse Now, uh, w what's the story there? Well, I mean, if Emilio ever watches your podcast or listens to your podcast. Or I hope so. I love Emilio. I would love to get him as a guest. Yeah. I was doing my close-ups in Breakfast Club. And the actors that were under 18 at the time, I believe it was Anthony and Molly, 
uh, and maybe Allie. No, Allie, no. But Anthony and Molly for sure, then they put in their, their doubles. So when they came around and did my coverage, the other, instead of Molly sitting there, she was off at school for a half day, they'd have Molly stunt double or her double, the person who was her double. And uh, same with Anthony Michael Hall, but Judd and Emilio were there, I remember. And instead of being cooperating actors, they would stick pencils in their noses and they would grab their finger and they would be drooling and trying to get me to laugh on my close up. So after about three or four takes, between takes, I look at them and say, you know, you guys would have been really, really helpful when Martin Sheen is doing Apocalypse Now and all of a sudden he has his heart attack and you're just sticking pencils up his nose, your nose and making fun of him while the guy's dying in front of you. And I was making the point that, you know, I feel like I'm dying up here and you're not helping me. I didn't know who Martin Sheen was in relation to Emilio Estevez. I had no, oh, no way. I had no idea. So John Hughes, all of a sudden, Emilio like freezes and looks at me and the whole set goes quiet. And I go, what, what did I say? And Hughes comes up and whispers in my ear, you know, Emilio is Martin's son. I went, oh no, I didn't know, I didn't know that. And Emilio froze up like, like a, you know, an ice cap, a polar ice cap and just totally, you know, crossed his arms like the, you know, uh, <laughs> jock he was in the film. And um, to this day, I think he just thinks I was bullshitting. And uh, when in actual fact, <laughs> I was just trying to make a point and I picked the wrong actor in the wrong situation. And wow. uh, it's funny, it's painful for me to recall, but it's also kind of what happens to me in my life is sometimes if there's a big pile of manure, there, yeah. I, I, I aim for the center of it and dive in head first. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, want to, I want to give a shout to a movie of his since you pointed out you know, that I should watch Bossa Nova. I guess our viewers should watch it also, but um, a movie that uh, he did that was just amazing, I thought. I mean, amazing was called The Public. Did you see that a couple of years back? Who, Steven or uh, Emilio? No, Emilio. He wrote, directed, and uh, starred oh, yeah. in a movie yeah. called The Public. Yeah, no, he was. A, he's a very, very talented person. Oh, um, unbelievable movie! But yeah, it's about a um, how the Cincinnati. I don't know how he picked Cincinnati to shoot in, but it's set in Cincinnati, and he's the head librarian of the Cincinnati Library, and he lets homeless people uh, hang out during the day in his library, and then they're having this vicious cold snap at night. And people are dying in the streets asleep in the cold. And finally, the, uh, the homeless people that, that populate the library during the day, one night they get fed up and they say, we're not going out, we're not leaving. And it becomes this wild uh, showdown between the homeless people and he takes their side and lets them stay in the, in the library. And then city officials and Alec Baldwin as a, as a cop, as a lead detective, trying to negotiate getting them out of there because the the homeless people make it like a hostage situation yeah and it's a funny movie it's a touching movie it's uh very unpredictable the way they resolve it is freaking brilliant i Did mean it's, it's movie? just an I've amazing seen, movie i've huh? seen it and i've seen the bobby movie too i mean did he make this i didn't like movie? bobby so much but i thought the public was amazing did he make this one before or after the bobby oh this was after this was I, he takes forever between projects. This was like seven years or 10 years after Bobby. Yeah, no, I've seen the, the public one. I think it was whatever on, on HBO. It was really good, really, really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I'm gonna get, hit a couple of things because I'm running out of time here, but um, uh, your favorite funny movie or movies you list, I'm just gonna read them off because uh, you know that way people can enjoy checking out your choices across the board, but we'll single out one or two of these. My Man Godfrey, Sullivan's Travels, Death of Stalin, Some Like It Hot, and The Big Lebowski. I think a lot of people know The Big Lebowski and Some Like It Hot. Um, I think that Sullivan's Travels is probably largely forgotten these days. I got into that movie 
uh, because I was re I was obsessed with John Hughes in high school, and I read that he was heavily influenced by Preston Sturges, the filmmaker of Sullivan's Travels, when he was making Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is my favorite movie. Next, maybe that and Ferris Bueller are my two favorite movies of all time. And I so I went and looked up Preston Sturges's films, and I fell in love with a lot of them. But Sullivan's Travels, that's a, it was like a half funny, half serious uh, movie about a, I think if I recall right, it's a filmmaker, uh, he, he feels like he's lost touch with the public and is during the depression as he goes traveling cross country like he's an average Joe with rough luck. And he's trying to see what it's like for the average uh, American amid the depression and it's just a really powerful movie but um, what are your thoughts about it well i mean you you said it it's a very very powerful film it's funny um joel uh uh come on john the our, our lead actor in it is is uh, joel mccray joel mccray of course and uh he's really really wonderful and yeah. he's funny he's endearing he's uh, you know, and that's where, of course, the Coen brothers got uh, "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?" Yeah. Um, the uh, the film uh, employs a lot of wonderful sort of techniques that I love in Preston Sturgis. It's very snappy and funny, yet it has a serious underbelly, and he delivers in the comedy department. But he makes an incredibly strong point at the end uh, uh, yeah. about, about how laughter is so important. And, uh, you know, the story hangs together. It's, I mean, it's got, it's got all his, uh, his crew. Is My Man Godfrey on that list? Yeah, it is. That's one I'm not familiar with. What, what's the deal with My Man Godfrey? Well, that film is enjoying an amazing resurgence and you can probably get it easily now. When I first fell in love with it, it was back in the days of early VHS. And I think I first saw it in a movie theater, but it, the prints were really, really horrible. It's a black and white film. Gregory Lacava is the director in 1936. It's Carol Lombard, William Powell, Eugene Pallette, uh, Gail Patrick, um, uh, a couple of other really funny actors in it. It's a very, very, it's it's similar in, in, uh, in theme to um, Sullivan's Travels is where like, this butler, played by William Powell, is, is homeless at the beginning. It's the Depression. This is made earlier than, um, than Sullivan's Travels. And Sullivan's Travels is just like 40, 41, just before US entered the war. And this one is um, deep depression, like 35, 6. And William Powell plays this guy, and he's uh, homeless. But we discover he's from a Boston family. He becomes a butler to an upper. Uh, Upper East Side New York family and uh, Carol Lombard is the daughter who falls in love with him and it is so well directed and so well acted and so well written. Uh, it stands up the test of time and it's, I think William Powell is a very funny, funny understated comic actor. And you know, in that department I didn't put on that list is like, I, I could tell you, we could talk about comic movies forever, but being there with oh, Peter, yeah. well, be, Peter Sellers is one of my favorite and then also I didn't put on that list, but is the, the apartment, the Billy Wilder movie? Of course, some like it hot, but any film by Billy Wilder is brilliant, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. And and um, okay, so then uh, uh, you listed as your favorite comedians or people that inspired you in comedy: Alan Arkin, Peter Sellers, Jack Oakey, Jack Lemmon, Walter Matthau. Uh, of course, Lemmon and Matthau did like seven movies together, so people should look those up. Uh, but um, Alan Arkin, you said you met him. Was there a particularly memorable aspect to that? Well, I've met Mr. Arkin a couple of times. I worked with his son in the play. So we did a play together, uh, Matthew, who's a really talented actor. Okay. So uh, his father, Alan, came to see the play. I also saw him when I was, uh, we, we met initially through some Second City alumni encounters. And he's a fantastic actor. The thing I love about Alan Arkin and a lot of actors that, that you know, the Second City thing is like stand-ups. I'm, I'm not, nothing against stand-up comedians. I mean, Lenny Bruce, Woody Allen, I mean, they're it's pretty amazing stand-up comedians over time. I'm not a huge fan of stand-up. Uh, the difference between stand-up and let's say uh, 
Second City is that stand up, uh, say funny things and, and act, uh, Second City actors say things funny. Um, and so I like the say things funny thing. I like characters. I like playing people that are in comic situations. Um, and Alan Arkin, man, phew. And the thing I love about Arkin is the same thing I loved about the Preston Sturgis, is that it's got range. It can go from very serious to very, very funny. Yeah. And like Steve Martin can do that too, in my opinion. And John Candy could do that. And, you know, they can do no harm in my books. And, and Matthew Broderick can do that. And, uh, you know, any of those skilled people like, you know, Matthew's incredibly talented as this Steve or Alan Ruck, you know, and, you know, all these guys. <laughs> okay. So then, uh, your I'm favorite funny you TV show? Pardon me. I'm giving you a blast. Yeah, that's fine. And you said favorite funny TV show or shows? Key and Peele, Car Fifty Four, Where Are You? Get Smart, Veep, Seinfeld, and Dick Van Dyke. If you had to pick one to comment on the most as a favorite, what would it be? I think I would choose. The, the latest one would be Veep. I just think that um, Julia is so skilled. The writing is great. The ensemble is fantastic. And Ianucci, Ianucci is brilliant. That way I can always also pay props to Death of Stalin, which I think is one of the funniest. The, yeah, it, it, Ianucci is the writer, director of both, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think he's the bomb. The yeah. Guy, the guy's a very, very talented individual and very, very, very funny uh in a satirical way that i you know and in friends david rashi is a friend of mine that worked on this uh inuchi project of, with james gandolfini i'm blanking on the name of it now but um it was a film england about england and the united states governmental but <laughs> that stuff is great that stuff is just great top drawer okay. yeah and then lastly what's your favorite funny book uh, you list in his own right a Spaniard in the works a penny saved is impossible by Ogden Nash, Catcher in the Rye, without feathers by Woody Allen. So, uh, which of those would you well, say? A penny saved is impossible is Ogden Nash silly rhymes, and I always loved those oh. as a kid. I think the funniest book I've read. Actually, I'm reading Frank Langella's uh, biography right now, and it's pretty damn. Really, uh, dropping names. I like reading showbiz tell-alls when they got when they get kind of drippy and good. <laughs> I like reading biographies overall, so that I find those kind of funny. I mean, um, ah, what's the funniest book I've read? I, I think um, maybe politically incorrect, but without feathers, I think is one of the funnier books I remember reading. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, hey, I'm I'm out of time unfortunately, but I want to thank you for taking the time to do this with me. And um, is, do you have a, any particular, I don't know if you run a site or not, any particular way that you want people to check out your work or if you want to give a shout out to your music? I know you have a band. Well, you can always listen to my music on Spotify or download it on iTunes or wherever you can download okay. it. Uh, and uh, uh, you can always contact me on Facebook on my, uh, my fan pages and just say hi and like that. Or, okay, or excellent. Twitter, at John Kapalos on Twitter. So. All right. Well, thanks. And until uh, next time, I'm Carl Kozlowski. This has been John Kapalos. And uh, till next time, uh, subscribe uh, to uh, Favorite Funny and uh, watch our other episodes and give us likes. Okay. So thanks and bye bye. Bye bye. One second.